praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Bible Speaks Live podcast. Once again, coming to you with a word that we that we pray uh, will help you out tonight. We pray that this word will be encouraging to you. We pray that this word will will have an impact on your spiritual well being. We come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He and He alone is able to do for you what no one else can do. What are you looking for tonight? What are you searching for? What do you need? Jesus Christ has the answer for your life absolutely, completely, and totally. Amen. We are streaming live right now over Facebook Live, and also we are streaming live on YouTube and also on Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform. Spreaker is spelled S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, and we welcome all of those who are listening in on Spreaker, who do listen in live, and who do download uh, this podcast. We want to thank you for listening in from around the world and across the United States. We thank you for your support. Amen. And also, you can go over to our YouTube channel and you can subscribe uh, to our channel there. Amen. So we want to bless the name of the Lord once again. And uh, if you are listening, if you are watching rather on Facebook, why don't you share share this page with someone, whether you are listening in live or whether you're listening and watching right now. Just share this page with someone. I'm sure that you know someone else who needs to be blessed tonight. You know someone else who needs a word from the Lord in these difficult times. We pray that this word will will touch you right where uh, you need. Because the Lord, the Lord is the one who knows the needs. And the Bible says that His word, His word never, His word never returns void, but it will, it will always accomplish the purpose where it was sent out for us. So once again, we thank, we thank and praise His name. We're going to pray. We're going to get started. On tonight, Lord, we bless your name. We thank you once again. You have allowed us to be in your presence. And Lord, we pray for the next few minutes, Lord, that your power and your presence, Lord, might be with us. Lead us and guide us, Lord Jesus. Speak through us, Lord Jesus. Touch someone who needs to hear a word from you on this night. Lord, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's much going on in this world. Uh, there's much happening. There's much taking place. Uh, there's so much. There's so many things going on in this world that it is, it is very possible it is quite possible for the Christian, for the Christian, it is quite possible that the Christian will uh, will lose face and, and become distracted by the things uh, that are going on. It's very easy to get pulled away. It's very easy for our attention to get pulled away. Is it? There's a reason why. There's a reason why the Lord calls his people sheep. He doesn't call us sheep because we are stupid, uh, because sheep have that reputation of, of being... Uh, that type of animal that really uh, is pretty defenseless. But he calls us sheep. He calls us sheep because sheep, they they bear under and they follow who they hear. But the Bible does say that we hear his voice and it's after him we should follow. The enemy is walking around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And he's looking for someone that he can manipulate. He's looking for someone who he can distract. And we must put ourselves, we must be that child of God who does not allow the enemy to come in and to take our minds away from the truth. I want to bring you to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll be reading one verse, we'll move around a little bit, but we're going to start right here in 1 Peter uh, chapter number 2, and starting in verse number 11, 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse number 11. 11. It says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. I want to talk to you tonight just for a few minutes about the battle for your righteous soul. The battle for your righteous soul. If you are a child of God, you can... You can, because of the Holy Spirit in you, because of the servant, you can sense, you can sense evil. There is a, there is a heightened sense uh, for the spiritual, for the child of God. You know, many times you know when you are in the presence of evil. Many times you know when you are in the presence of something that is not right. It is, it is not, uh, it is not intuition. You're a child of God. You have the Holy Spirit in you and he speaks and he lets you know when things are not right. He lets you know when everything around you is not right. 
That's what that's one of the things that the Holy Spirit does. He gives us that ability to discern. That is his spirit speaking in us, letting us know that all things are not as they should be. And so we need to pay attention, pay attention to that sometimes still small voice that speaks to us and tells us that everything is not all right. And you, by seeing this world and seeing the things that are happening in this world right now, you are well aware, you are well aware that everything is not as it should be. The Bible says here in this verse that we are strangers and we are pilgrims. We are we are just here. We are we are actually as Christians we are traveling through. This is not our final resting place. This is not the place where we where we need to pitch a tent and and prepare to stay here for a very very long time. This is this is only temporary. Our, our real home is in heaven. That's the place where we were where we are headed and we need to always be mindful of that. So as strangers and pilgrims, he tells us in this verse that we need to keep ourselves away from, abstain, keep yourselves away from the fleshly desires, those things that pull at you, those things that, those things that would have you to be a part. Listen, the world, the world, the Bible says that the world knows its own. The world knows its own. There's a reason why you now, as a Christian, you you have a you have a level of discomfort uh, when you are in the presence of those who don't know the Lord. Sometimes, sometimes there's a there's a level of discomfort when you are in a place where you should not be. That's once again, that's the Holy Spirit in you that, that you should not be comfortable in a sinful environment. Now, I know there are times when the child of God will go to or go into certain places to evangelize. That's one thing. But if you cannot stay there, you cannot expose yourself. You cannot expose yourself to evil for a long period of time. It weighs heavy on the soul. It weighs heavy. This is why it says in this verse, it says that these fleshly lusts, these things that pull at us, they, they wage war against your soul. Waging war, there's a fight going on. There's a fight going on. And that fight, that battle is for your soul. It's for your soul. All we need to do, all we need to do is go back uh, into uh, the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. And we see, we see Lot. Let's go back to Genesis chapter number 13. Genesis chapter number uh, 13. And we see that Lot himself we find out later on that Lot was a righteous man and we find out that he had one problem. He he coveted. He wanted more than what he needed to have. He wanted more than probably what the Lord wanted him to have. And here we see when there's a disagreement bec between his, uh, his herdsmen and his uncle Abraham's herdsmen, uh, we see that there was a bit of contention between the two. And Abraham gives him the, the choice to separate because Abraham says, listen, we both have all of these all of these sheep and we cannot stay together. You go the direction that you want to go and I'll go the direction, whatever direction you go, I'll go in the other direction. And the Bible says here in uh, verse number 10, Verse number 10, the Bible says that Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. Verse 11, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves from one, the one from the other. So Lot made his choice. Lot made his choice. Lot put himself in Sodom and Gomorrah. And there is no doubt that Lot did not know. Lot did not understand the toll that it was going to take on his soul. He did not know. He just went after what he saw. We have to be careful that, that we don't run after the first thing that we see. We have to be careful that we don't run after that thing that looks good and smells good and looks right and feels right. We cannot go by that. We have to go by the Spirit of God in us. What does the Spirit say? 
Many times we need to pray about things. Literally, that word pray about has become a catchphrase in the Christian community for years. Pray about it. I have to pray about it. I have to pray about it. Do we really pray about it? Do you really get down and say, Lord, this, is this what you want me to do? Or do we just go by our own feelings, how it feels to us? We need to pray about things. Literally. Lord, what do you say? What do you want me to do? And I'm sure that the Lord will, will speak to us in the right way. And we have to trust. We have to trust what the Lord says. We have to trust his words and not our own. So Abram, so so Lot rather, Lot put himself, Lot put himself in a serious predicament. Lot, the Bible says that when these two men, when these two men came uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it, sent by God, dispatched by God himself, the Bible says that he was sitting at the gate of the city. And this means a lot. This means a lot. So he was in this place called Sodom and Gomorrah, and these, these twin cities, which were known for their wicked behavior, that the men, the men were exceedingly sinful, as the Bible puts it. And we find out how sinful uh, in a few verses. Uh, and, and Lot, sitting at the gate of the city, means that he had some clout, meaning that he that people knew who he was. He may have had some sort of position in the city. Uh, he may have been a, as we would look at it today, he may have been a some sort of politician or councilman or some sort of some sort of government. I'm, when I'm talking, I'm talking loosely about government when I'm talking about uh, um, the children of Israel here because they they had they were not yet the children of Israel uh, fully. Uh, but Lot sat there sitting at the gate of the city, sitting at the place where where deals were made, sitting at the place uh, that was opening up to the rest uh, to, to the rest of the people to come in. It meant that Lot that Lot had some power. And here he was. He had gotten himself enmeshed, had probably gotten himself entangled in the affairs of the city. And by this time, knowing the type of city it was, understanding that the city was overrun with wickedness and homosexual behavior. He, he was surrounded by this. And here's what it says in 2 Peter. 2 Peter concerning this man, Lot. 2 Peter uh, chapter number 2, verses 7 and 8. And this is what we must avoid. We must avoid this. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. And delivered... Just Lot or righteous Lot delivered righteous Lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. He was vexed day after day, it goes on to say, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. That is the place where Lot was. That is the place where we sometimes find ourselves and how we respond, how we respond to the evil or wicked stimuli around us is going to define how we live this Christian life. Can you, you're going to live it in misery. You're going to live it in, in, in a vexed uh, state of mind. And when the Bible says vexed here, it simply means uh, that he was, he was, he had become, distressed. He had become distressed uh, by what he saw. He had become, he had got, he had gotten to a place where he was annoyed and irritated by the things that he saw and by the things that he heard. He was around it. He was surrounded completely by sinful behavior and it took its toll on his soul. It took its toll. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're a child of God, this world, this world is going to take a toll this world is going to take a toll on your spiritual life if you don't go at it in the right way. If you don't go about serving God in the proper way, this world will take its toll on you and it will come after you and it will not let go. It will not let go. We must make sure, we must make doubly sure that we are serving God, that we are keeping our eyes on Christ and his cross keeping his eyes on what Jesus did for us, if we are going to walk 
in this life in a proper position. The world will cave in on us. And we have to make sure that we keep ourselves from the things of the world. This is a fine line. Talking about keeping yourselves away from the world. There's so many things that are in the world. So many things that we do that are part of the world. So many things that we must be a part of, in a sense. But yet, the Bible tells us not to get enmeshed. Abstain. We cannot. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone have uh, the love of the world in them, the love of the Father is not in them. We must be careful. There are so many things that we can get ourselves involved in. We cannot, the Bible says, we must not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We must not be. What does that mean? That's not just talking about relationships, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. Yes, it has that's what it means also. But it's also me it also means your business relationships. Uh you cannot forge you cannot forge a deep intimate relationship with those who are in the world. You don't have anything in common. You really don't. And the world is is attracting us and the world is is pulling at us and we want to go and do this and we want to go and do that and the world says let's everybody do this. And it's and it's easy to get caught up in all of the in all of the rah rah that the world is 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 throwing out. We don't want to be left out. We want to make sure that we are in the know. We want to make sure that we that we also know what's going on in the world. Someone asks us a question. We want to be able to tell them. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Oh yeah, I know about that. Oh yeah, I saw that. I watched that. We want to be able to say that we are a part. That we are not different from everybody else. But here's the thing. You are different from everybody else if you are a child of God. It's not a problem if you don't know about the latest movie. It's not a problem if you don't know about the, the latest song that dropped. It's not a problem if you don't know these things. These things do not define who you are. You are a child of God. You have been called to a higher purpose. There's a higher purpose for your life. You don't need to, to be a part of what the world gives out. Let me read, let me read, we mentioned, I touched on it just a moment ago, but let me read uh, once again the words of Jesus in John, the words of Jesus in John chapter 15, John chapter 15 and verses 18 and 19, John chapter 15 verses 18 and 19, this is Jesus speaking, he says, if the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. That is the place where we are. That is the place where we are. How should the world, how should we receive the world and how should they perceive us? This verse tells us. This verse tells us. The world, under normal, natural circumstances, being people of Christ, whom he has personally called out of the world, which is known in scripture as the kingdom of darkness, we have been called out as being his people, children of the light, the Bible says, who are here to expose the darkness, being that, the Bible says that the world, is going to hate you. Not put their arms around you. Not embrace you. Not say what a good person you are. Such a nice person. It, it, it's nothing wrong if they do say that. There are those places, there are those occasions where people will see that you are nice and they, and they will not necessarily associate it with the things of God. And there, all people are not outwardly and noticeably antagonistic to Jesus and the gospel. Every time you see somebody in the street and you say Jesus, they're not going to just jump on you and want to hurt you and kill you. You have co-workers, some co-workers, they can deal with the fact that you're a Christian as long as you don't go in their space. But for the most part, the world does not understand. For the most part, the world is antagonistic against Christ. And it's not you, it's Christ in you. Don't think it's you. I know. 
I know your co-workers and the people at your school and the people that you know sometimes you, you, you're wondering why, what did I do? Why they don't like me? Why are they trying to do this? Why is everything going against me? It's not you. If you're a child of God, it is not you. It is Christ in you. There is something, and I use that word very loosely, something. We know what that something is. It, it, it's, it's Christ. It's his spirit. There's something in you. There's something about you. That they cannot place their finger on, but they're just, there's a level of discomfort when they are around you, when they are near you. They don't know how to behave themselves. They don't know what they should do. Some, they just, they just back off and some are more antagonistic. Some will challenge you. Some will challenge. I've had people challenge my walk with the Lord, challenge to get uh, involved in, in uh, uh, conversations that were, not going anywhere just to just to try to to try to rip me just to try to get on my nerves just to try to get me to respond and react in a negative way fat people come at me in that way but you have to realize what's going on and you can't bite that bone you can't respond and react in a negative way near the world around the world in the world they are watching they're watching your every move if you have made a statement concerning Christ and they know that you love the Lord they know that you're praising God. I'm telling you, they think you're supposed to be perfect. The world thinks you're supposed to be perfect. Don't you Don't you mess up. Because they're going to let you know. And if they don't let you know, they're going to take a, make a mental note that you did something wrong. And when something comes, they're going to say, but remember when you did this. Remember when you said that. That's why we have to, we have to stay close to the Lord. We have to stay close to the Lord. We, we, we have to. There's a way that we live this Christian life that we don't, that we don't, we're not intending to offend. But if you live this Christian life properly, you will offend. You will offend. In one way or another, you're going to offend. Sometimes you offend without even opening up your mouth. You offend. But that's the Spirit of God in you. They sense something. And they don't know uh, what it is. But Jesus says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. So if you would love the world, it would be all right. They would be loving you. They would be embracing you. They would be putting their arms around you. And if you and if you hide the fact that you're a child of God, if you don't let people know, or if people don't ask, if people ask and you don't, if you don't tell them outright exactly who you are and what you are, doesn't mean you have to go into a sermon. Doesn't mean you have to go into a great testimony and tell them, listen, I... I'm a Christian. That means different things to different people. Some people think that they're Christian because they live in the United States. So just because you say you're a Christian does not necessarily mean that they're going to say, oh, they're a child of God. They, they love Jesus. Sometimes you have to be more specific. Hey, I love the Lord. That'll do it. Now, when you say I love the Lord, they're wondering, love the Lord? What does that mean? But once you tell them that, they're going to be expecting you to be somebody more than what you are. You are not perfect. But they'll be looking for a level of perfection in you. The world will. So the world will love its own. But because you are not of the world, that's why, because the, he, Jesus has chosen you out of the world, that's why the world will hate you. Hate you. But fear not, because they hated Jesus first. It's all about Jesus. Remember, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus. And so this is the world. This is why the Bible says in the book of James that we should not love the world. Rather, it says in 1 John that we should not love the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. The world hates us. Why do we seek to be, why do we seek to be uh, embraced? by the world. Why do we want the world to give us a, a, a thumbs up? You don't want a thumbs up from the world. You don't. You don't want a thumbs up from the world. That means that they have gotten the wrong message. That means that they have gotten the wrong signal. Once again, this is, this is in general. Once again, everybody is not antagonistic against the gospel, at least not outwardly. But everyone does not receive the message of Christ. This is why you can give your testimony and people stay the same. This is why you can preach a powerful word and people will not respond at all. 
because there's a blindness. There's a bondage that has taken place and they do not realize, the world does not realize that they are under the sway. As the Bible says, they are under the sway, under the control of the evil one. They don't realize it. Not that they're possessed, but they don't realize that the enemy has shielded and blinded their, their hearts from being able to see the truth. The Bible says that the enemy has blinded the minds of those uh, who do not believe so that they do not so that they are not able to see the light of the glorious gospel. And that's what the enemy. That's what the Bible says. The enemy, the enemy knows of the glorious gospel. The enemy knows that the gospel is glorious. Not that it moves him. Not that it's going to make any change in what he does. But he's seen what the what the gospel does to people. He's seen what it does. He sees that it changes. He said he sees that it transforms. He sees that it changes them from someone that who whom they whom he was able to manipulate into someone now that belongs to Christ. He has seen what the power of God does. He has seen it and having seen it, he doesn't want anybody to be a part of what Christ does. And so he try, he tries to distort and disannul you from away, away from that which he knows will change your life. So the world loves its own, but we are to abstain from those fleshly lusts that war against our soul. You see, if we don't, if we don't abstain from fleshly lusts, if we rush in, if we become a part of the world system. We run the risk. We run the risk of being desensitized. Desensitized. And when we're talking about being desensitized, it's simply, it's simply becoming less sensitive. Less sensitive to the evil that is around us, to the cruelty, uh, to, the, to the violence, uh, to the suffering, to sin in general. It's becoming less sensitive to it. Listen, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, that means that you are sensitive to sin. You are sensitive to sin. You are aware, you know when sin is in the camp. You know when there is sin in your own life. You see, this whole thing of being a part of what the world does, it not only can cause you to be desensitized to, to the world, it not only will cause you to be desensitized to the world, to the sin in the world, but it will also cause you to be desensitized to the sin that is within you. That's why. That's why we have to step away from the things of the world. As difficult as it is, we have to step away because it's going to have an impact on our soul. You don't want your soul to be numbed out. You don't want your soul to be deadened. You don't want your soul to be anesthetized. You don't want that. You want to have a heightened sense of your own spiritual condition. You want to have a heightened sense of the condition of the world. And the world is in a terrible predicament. The world is in a sinful place right now. And you want to have your, your, your spiritual senses intact. You want to be able to know when something is not right. You want to be able to know when all things are not well in your own spirit. You know when something is not right. You know when you're doing something that's not right. You, you, you know yourself. And you want to always keep that heightened sense uh, you, you want your spirit to be on alert, so to speak. Never, never do you, never do you want to be in a place where you don't recognize sin for what it is. Never get, you never want to get to a place where you're in a place where you shouldn't be and you think that it's all right and you feel that it's all right. I know there are functions that we attend. We go to weddings. We go to different things. We go to celebrations. Listen, these are things that there's nothing inherently wrong with, with being a part of these things. But once again, you, you cannot find a level of comfort there. You must not find a level of comfort because here, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says it's a shame to think of those things that are done by them in the dark. You know, something happens. Uh, you know, I remember when I was younger, when I was younger, because I, it didn't happen when I was older. Uh, but when I was younger, I can remember, I can remember uh, my mother taking me into uh, a bar with her, with her brother, with my uncle. I was a little kid. And I'm talking, I'm talking about, I'm talking about 40, 
plus years ago. I'm talking about 50 years ago. Okay, so going to a bar back then was not like it is now, I guess. And and I remember just sitting there. I remember just sitting there and the place was dark. That's why I remember that it was like dim. The lights were dim. Now I remember seeing the bar. I remember a lot of you know, a lot of different uh, bottles of wine behind a counter or something like that. But I just remember it was dark in there. I literally remember sitting inside uh, of this place. And and the Bible says, you know, we have been called out of darkness. Out of darkness. Why? Why are these types of places darkened? Because it, 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 it tells us that, listen, there is... Possibly, very, very possibly, sinful activity that's taking place. Okay? We as Christians are to expose the darkness. We are to expose the darkness. That's what the gospel does. The gospel exposes darkness. Anything that brings light, anything that brings light is going to expose darkness. You are a children, a, a child of the light. You are uh, a child of the light, and and being a child of the light, being a child of the light means means that there's a certain way that you must now carry yourself. There's a certain way you must carry yourself. You cannot do. You cannot be like everybody else. I know there's something in us sometimes that we we just, as I said earlier, we, we you just don't want to be left behind. You, you just don't want to seem like the odd one out. You just don't want to be so different from everyone else. But you are. You are. Own it. Own it. You are different. There is a battle taking place for your soul. The enemy is going to try any tactic that he is allowed to get into your soul. And so you must be on the alert. The Bible says to guard your heart. Because out of it flow the issues of life. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Listen, you're not missing anything by being a part of the world. You are not missing a thing. Keep yourself from being entangled with the world. Don't allow yourself to be desensitized to the sinfulness around you. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot afford for this to happen in your life. There's too much taking place right now in this world. The world needs Jesus. The world needs Jesus. You have the answer. Jesus is the answer. Now, as we said, sometimes you don't need to say a word and people will, and, and people will be able to figure out who you are and what you're about. But many times you have to say something. Many times you have to say something. And we must be careful that we don't beat around the bush. And, and have people play 10 questions with us. Can you guess who I am? Can you guess what I am? We have to tell, come out and tell people exactly who we are. I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. He changed my life. He set me free. He, he, he transformed me. These are the things that the world needs to hear. There's an old song that we used to sing back in the day. You probably heard it. Very popular. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. There's an element of truth in that. There's an element of truth in that. But well, that's the world's version. The world's version of love is a different kind of love that the Bible speaks about. What the world needs now is Jesus. Sweet Jesus. <laughs> that's what the world needs right now. But the world doesn't know it. That's why we're here. We are, we are set. The Bible says uh, that a city... Set upon a hill cannot be hid. A city set upon a hill cannot be hid. You have a light. You got to let it shine. You can't hide it. Like the song says, you cannot hide it under a bushel. You got to let it shine. You got to tell somebody. You got to show somebody. You got to be who you are. You got to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You got to let them see your good works. So you cannot be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed. Do not allow the world to put you in its mold. To fit you in. Be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. A 
renewed mind is a heart that is set on fire for the Lord. Your soul is under attack. And I'm not saying that you're going to, uh, for the child of God, that you're going to, I, I, I am not trying to say you can lose your soul. I'm not trying to say that Lot was going to lose his soul. But I'm saying the stability, the stability of your soul is at stake. The stability of it. Are you going to ground yourself in the truth? Are you going to stand firm and let nothing move you? Or are you going to be on shaky ground? Because you're allowing the fleshly lust that are warring against your soul to come in on you. And then you become a part of what the world is offering. Stand clear. Stay away. Abstain from the fleshly lust that war against the soul. You see, it sounds like such a, a bad thing about Lot. And it, and it was bad because we know what Lot did. Lot would eventually offer his daughters in return for the men who came to his house uh, to, to be with, in a sexual manner, the two angels who they didn't know were angels. But Lot offered his daughters... You see, this is what, and, and once again, his righteous soul. So, so Lot was a righteous man. Righteous man in the Old Testament means that he was a man of God. It was the near equivalent of saying that he was a Christian. Even though he was not a Christian in the same sense that we know today. Because he did not know Christ at that time. He did not know Christ. But he was a man of God. He was a righteous man. And because of what he saw and heard, it had that effect on him, and he let his guard down. He let his guard down, and he offered his daughters to these men. That was an act of his flesh. That was a total act of the flesh. And this is what can happen to the child of God, who is surrounded, and I know you're surrounded by sinfulness every day. You go to your job, the music is playing. You go to your job and there's cursing and carrying on. You go to your job and they're making jokes, you, you, uh, uh, dirty jokes. You go to your job and there's all sorts of things going on. And you're there. And sometimes, sometimes you don't want to be there. And what do you do? What do you do? You're in your cubicle and all this is going on. You don't really want to be a part. But what do you do? What do you do? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You got to turn your eyes on Jesus. You got to see Jesus. You really got to see Jesus. I had to do it. I had to do it. You have to see Jesus. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to get it right all the time. But you got to see Jesus. You got to literally see Jesus. Turn your eyes on him. Focus on his power. Focus on his strength. Focus on what he has done for you. You see, here's what it says. You see, it says concerning Lot, let me go back, in the, and as we close here, let me go back into the book of Second uh, Peter and start in chapter number four. It says, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, Verse number five, and if he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, uh, condemned with them with the overthrow, making them an example unto them that are that should after live ungodly. And then it talks about if, if God delivered Lot, if God delivered, you see, you see, that's the word. That's the word that we didn't talk about. It says, and delivered righteous Lot. See, we just were focusing on the fact that he was a righteous man and that he was and that he was affected by the things he saw and heard. That's what we were focusing on. But here's the end result of all of that. It says that God delivered him. God was able to deliver him out of that situation. God was able to deliver him out of that predicament, in that place where he was. In his life, in his soul, God was able to deliver him. It says, and delivered righteous Lot 
who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And it says once again, that righteous man dwelling among them, he dwelt among them. In seeing and hearing, he vexed his righteous soul from day to day. That lets us know that it was something that Lot did himself, as we said. He, he, the Bible says that he vexed his righteous soul. Based on what he had done, he put himself in that situation. But there is deliverance. There is a deliverance that is in God. There is a deliverance that is in him. So if you find yourself in a difficult place, if you find yourself in that place where you just don't know what to do, if you don't know how you got here and how you're going to get out, if you're in that place where you just, you find yourself being pulled into the world, if you find yourself in a place like that, there is deliverance in God. He says here in verse number nine, because God did all those things, including delivering righteous lot. God still delivers his people. God delivers his people. God is in the business of bringing freedom to his people. Yes, it is possible for the child of God to find themselves in a sense of bondage. In a place where they feel like they can't get free. Yes, the child of God can be in a place like that. But there is deliverance. There is deliverance. The song says, there is deliverance in thee. And in wonder I fall on my knees. My soul waits on the Lord in the hope of his promise. Deliverance will come. It says here in verse number nine, the Lord knows. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. He knows how to deliver you out of your terrible trial. He knows how to deliver you, deliver you out of the difficult time that you are having. He knows how to deliver you. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. God brings deliverance. Praise him. Praise him. Going back, echoing back to the words of that song that we just said. And in wonder, I fall on my knees. Wait on the Lord. In the hope of his promise. In the hope of his promise, deliverance will come. My soul waits on the Lord from the night till the morning, like the night watchman waiting for the coming of the dawn. That's how the song says it. And that's all taken from scripture. You got to wait on God. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's going to get hard. It's going to get difficult. But you got to wait on Jesus. He's going to bring a mighty deliverance. A mighty deliverance into your life. As long as you keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes focused, fixed on Jesus. Take your eyes off the world. Stop trying to please people. Stop trying to make everybody happy. You're not going to make everybody happy. You're not going to make anybody happy. As long as you do what God says, you're not going to make people happy. You're not. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Let Jesus do for you what no one else can do. Rest in his promises. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Rest in Jesus. You don't know the hard time I'm having. You don't know. I feel like giving up. I feel like throwing in the towel. I don't know what to do. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Rest in his promises. When the Bible says, come unto me, all ye that labor, don't think that's just talking. Don't just think that's talking about those who don't know the Lord. There's a rest for the people of God. Hebrews talks about it. There's a rest in the kingdom in, in the, for the people of God. But you can't go in in a state of unbelief. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. If you're tired of trying to do it on your own, if you're trying to, tired of trying to make it happen, if you're tired of trying to be perfect in your own strength, if you're tired of trying to live the Christian life in your own power, if you're tired of trying to live the Christian life by, by, by keeping a bunch of rules and, and, and regulations, if you're tired and you don't see it going anywhere, there's a reason because that's not how the way that's not way you, the way you do it. We don't live this Christian life 
by all the things that we do. I got to do this. I got to do it. I got to do it. I got to do that. We live this Christian life by what we believe. By what we believe. Where's your faith? That's what it's all about. Where is your faith? Let me read Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And then we'll call it a night. Galatians chapter number 2. And this text says it all. Hear it well. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. It says, I am crucified. This is Paul speaking. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He says, I live. Yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, he says, I live in the flesh. Rather, and the life which I now live in the flesh, that means the life that conducting, doing his everyday business that he lives, he says, I live it by the faith of the Son of God, or in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It is no longer you who are living. It is Christ living in you and through you. He says, he says, this life that I now live in the flesh, in the body, he says, I live by the faith in Jesus Christ. How do you live this Christian life? How do you get through this Christian life? By faith in Jesus Christ. Some people think you live this Christian life by reading 10 chapters a day. That'll keep the devil away. By fasting for 30, 40, 50, 60 days. That'll keep the devil away. They think that's what the Christian life is about. Going to church every Sunday or going to church every night. They think that's how you live the Christian life. Nothing wrong with going to church every night if you can, if you're able. There's nothing wrong with reading 10 chapters a day if you have the time. There's nothing wrong with fasting for a period of time in your life. But if you think it's those things that are going to empower you, it's, it's, it's not. That's religion. He says, this life that I now live in the flesh, of this body, I live by the faith, by having faith in the Son of God. Faith in Christ. Your faith is only as good as the object that it's placed in. So you don't put your faith in how many days you fast or fast dead. You don't put your faith in how many days a week you come to church. You don't put your faith in Sunday staying in church all day praying. You don't put your faith in how much you pray. You don't put your faith in how much you read your Bible. How do you know if it's enough? How do you know if 40 days is enough? How do you know if 50 days is enough? You don't put your faith in the doing of things. That's not how you live the Christian life. You put your you live the Christian life by faith in Jesus Christ who loved you and gave himself for you. It's a lot of things that happened there at the cross. It's a lot of things that happened at the cross. And you are now a recipient. Your deliverance. You've been set free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to the law. Don't back. Don't go back to the thing that held you. Don't go back there. Don't go back there. You've been set free in Christ Jesus. Amen? Don't go back. Don't go back. Denounce the world. Don't be desensitized by the world. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He is your deliverer. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you, Lord, once again. You have allowed us, Lord, to speak this word. Lord, Father, we pray that these words have gone out into going out into cyberspace, Lord, to touch someone, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish the purpose where it was sent. Lord, we know someone will hear these words, and someone will someone will pick up these words, and someone will run with these words, and someone will someone will be strengthened and empowered by this word. Someone, 
uh, someone will be admonished by these words. Lord, we pray that your word will do whatever it is that you want it to do. Lord, we know that nothing, nothing that's done in your name is in vain. So, Lord, have your way. Speak through this word, even now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We want to thank. We want to. We want to thank those who have watched and listened uh, tonight. Uh, once again, those on Facebook, share this page with someone. Uh, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to our. Go to our channel on Spreaker. You will find several other podcasts that we do also uh, produce, and I'm sure that you will be blessed uh, by these particular podcasts. Amen. And so. We're going to leave you tonight. Uh, we're going to leave you tonight thanking God for you coming in and listening to this word. Amen. God is able and God will bring deliverance to your life. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. This is me. That's you. We'll see you next time on The Bible Speaks Live. And don't forget tomorrow night for the listening for the Cutting It Right Wednesday night Bible study. God bless you. Have a good night.